Our second speaker is Dr. O'Connor from the Sense Foundation Research Center, who will be talking about mitochondrial rejuvenation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, especially, as everyone else uh, says, to Aubrey, not only for the invitation, but for hiring me to work at the uh, Sons Foundation. Uh, this is our, uh, our new uh, research center here in, uh, in Mountain View, California, and we just uh, set it up in the past year. And uh, I've uh, had the pleasure of, uh, of being a part of uh, making that new lab a reality. So, uh, talking about mitochondria, uh, rejuvenation and mitochondrial aging. And so uh, I think you all are probably familiar with the basic premise, but I'll go over it briefly. Uh, mitochondria are the power plants of the cells, and uh, they produce most of your energy. They're also unique in that they have their own DNA. Uh, they're the only organelle that has their own DNA and is uh, replicated uh, independent uh, of, the, of the nuclear DNA. Uh, and of course, uh, like any good power plant, uh, they produce pollution uh, in the form of free radicals. And so the, the basic uh, premise that, that we're working on is that uh, free radicals damage DNA, that, uh, and, and that the, uh, the free radicals produced by the mitochondria uh, can damage that DNA. So the, uh, the comparison that I like to make is that this is like um, putting, building a schoolyard next to a coal-fired power plant. Uh, it's, it's not a good idea, right? Uh, your kids are going to be running around outside and they're going to be breathing all this pollution and they're going to get asthma and, uh, and, and stuff like that. And, and so this is a similar idea that you're producing all these free radicals right in the proximity uh, of this DNA. It's very susceptible to damage. It doesn't have the protection of the nucleus. It doesn't have the distance uh, away from it and of the uh, uh, repair machinery of the, of the nucleus to take care of it. And so uh, this is the problem. Uh, you have damage to mitochondrial DNA, uh, which results in dysfunctional mitochondria, and uh, a, a part of uh, aging and the diseases of aging. So there's uh, a number of potential approaches uh, that you could take uh, to doing this. I'm not going to go through them all in, in any detail. I just have to say that uh, if you have a known mutation, you could uh, target the, the DNA that has that mutation for destruction. Uh, you could replace uh, the uh, enzymes of the respiratory chain uh, with, with those from uh, other organisms, uh, simpler ones perhaps. Uh, you could do, uh, import the RNA instead of protein into the mitochondria. Uh, and I think we'll be hearing uh, something relating to this uh, idea in the next talk. Uh, and I'm uh, excited to hear that. And uh, you've heard some stuff about uh, mitochondrial transport here. What I'm going to talk about is uh, allotopic expression, meaning uh, taking the, the genes that are uh, supposed to be expressed by the mitochondria and expressing them in the nucleus. <coughs> so the vast majority of genes that regulate the mitochondria, that make up the mitochondria, are already made in the nucleus, uh, over uh, a thousand of them, and they're made like any other proteins. Uh, and the way that proteins are targeted to the mitochondria is by sticking an MTS uh, on the end of them, a mitochondrial targeting sequence, and just like any other peptide uh, localization sequence, it uh, can target them to the mitochondria. Uh, so the, the problem that we have is that there are 13 uh, genes that code for proteins in the mitochondria that, uh, that, that are not, uh, that we want to, to get there. So these are those 13 genes, uh, and uh, I don't mean to, to bore you with all the details, but um, they are important, and which complexes they're a part of are important. So uh, remember that will be a quiz on that later. Uh, so there's five complexes of the respiratory chain, uh, and uh, the proteins, uh, all, all 13 of the genes that are coded by the mitochondria make up our, our components of these five complexes. So they're not elsewhere in the mitochondria, making up the bulk structure of the mitochondria, they're all part of, uh, of the respiratory chain. There's seven of them in complex one, none in complex two, uh, one in complex three, three in complex four, and two in uh, the ATP synthase. Just a, 
uh, a few examples of diseases that are caused by uh, inherited mutations in, uh, in mitochondria. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a optic neuropathy uh, that can be quite severe and cause blindness. It's been uh, implicated uh, in, in mutations in complex one can cause that optic neuropathy. Uh, have been implicated in Parkinson's disease, uh, exercise tolerance, and you know, fatiguing of, of the muscles, and uh, Lay syndrome, which is a uh, peripheral neuropathy. Uh, and many of these diseases can be uh, quite severe. So our goal is to express these 13 genes in the nucleus. Uh, that's not enough. We need to target them to the mitochondria and then have them effectively replace the loss of these uh, 13 genes. Uh, and, and I should point out that uh, if, if it works, uh, the allotopic expression uh, will be uh, great for, uh, for treating uh, the inherited diseases, uh, perhaps uh, even more significantly than, than aging. So how can we do it? Well, I told you that they have uh, an MTS on them. So all we have to do is clone them with a targeting sequence, and they'll go to the to the mitochondria, right? Well, it, it turns out that people have been working on this for over 20 years, and the field was uh, pioneered by uh, Philip Nagley, uh, and there's been some limited success, some proteins that have, uh, it, it will target them to the mitochondria, but import can be a problem. Uh, these 13 uh, proteins are all quite hydrophobic, and so uh, it's, it's sometimes difficult to get import and uh, internalization and, and, and correct incorporation into the complexes. And furthermore, when the hydrophobic proteins get into the, get stuck in the import machinery, that can be toxic for the cells. So there's been some limited success over the years in incorporating some uh, of the genes, but uh, there, it's always been this drawback. So the, uh, the, the co-translational approach that, that uh, we wanna try is uh, inspired by nature. Uh, because it's not as simple uh, targeting of, of proteins in mitochondria isn't as simple as uh, in, in nature as just sticking an MTS on them. It turns out that about half of all RNAs that code for mitochondrial proteins actually go to the mitochondria before they're translated. And uh, so the mechanism of that is partly understood. There's a lot that's not known about it. But uh, in, uh, in one scenario in, in yeast, uh, a protein called PUF3 can bind uh, RNAs uh, as they're uh, coming out of the nucleus and shuttle them to the mitochondria and prevent them from being translated before they get there. So uh, our uh, Marisol Coral Dobrinsky is a, uh, a collaborator of ours and a uh, Sun-supported uh, researcher. She's been working on this for a few years and uh, she's published a, uh, several papers uh, using this technique uh, to uh, express genes in the nucleus and target them to the mitochondria. And so she's had some success. And so uh, this, I think, is the most exciting paper that she's published where she gave these rats uh, uh, the uh, optic neuropathy by mutating uh, ND4 and then rescued it by allotopically expressing uh, ND4 in these rats, and they could see it again. Uh, so, our uh, goals in, in this uh, is, is to repeat um, uh, Dr. Carl Dobrinsky's work. There's uh, a lot of skepticism in the field. People have been working on this allotopic expression thing for a long time. It's kind of a holy grail uh, in terms of being able to rescue mitochondrial mutations. And there's, there's a lot of uh, frustration and skepticism in the field. So first of all, we want to repeat what, uh, what she did. And this is how she did it. Um, you take uh, an MTS on the five prime here from a, uh, a mitochondrial gene, in this case, uh, COX-10. And then uh, it turns out that uh, what's been learned about the RNA targeting is that the three prime untranslated region is also important for uh, the, the binding of the uh, RNA binding protein, which can localize, uh, which can shuttle it to the, to the mitochondria. And so she created these two constructs in, uh, in several different genes, this being positive and this being negative. And so here's a, a generic uh, untranslated region. And so uh, to, to kind of uh, do this with even more uh, rigor, we've added the other two possibilities, uh, taking off the MTS 
and you know, adding on a return UTR on top of MTS. So all four possibilities. And we've extended it, so we've made four different constructs for each gene that we're working on. And so far, we're working on five genes. The first three genes are ones that uh, we, uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Cole Brinsky uh, has worked on and published on uh, MB1, MB4, and ATP6. And we got the uh, recoded versions of those uh, from her and then combed them into, the, into these uh, expression constructs. And then we uh, synthesized uh, these other two genes, uh, ATP8 and cytochrome B. Uh, what, uh, we, so I just started working on this uh, th this year. And so what I don't have is, uh, is, a, is a ton of data and, and success uh, to show you yet. But what I want to convince you of is that we've set up a good system for, uh, for studying uh, this, uh, uh, this technique. And, and hopefully uh, making it work. So we have created uh, quite a few cell lines. So I showed you 20 different combinations. We've, uh, so far, uh, the first thing we started with was the uh, HEC293 cells, uh, because they're easy uh, to work with. Uh, we're also uh, creating uh, foreskin fibroblast um, cell lines uh, in collaboration uh, with the uh, uh, Cantesia lab at the, at the Buck Institute. Uh, so this is our strategy for, for analyzing these cell lines. And so I'm going to show you uh, some data from the HEC293 cells. So we're uh, checking, we're purifying DNA and checking for stable integration into the genome. Then we're purifying RNA and uh, doing RT-PCR to uh, look at the message. Uh, finally, of course, we need to look at uh, protein by Western blotting and fluorescence. Uh, more biochemistry to look and see that the proteins are actually going to the right place in the mitochondria and uh, interacting with, uh, uh, with the right proteins in the, in the correct protein complexes, then activity assays to make sure that those complexes are doing their jobs. And then uh, the, the exciting uh, thing is to do rescue experiments on mutant cell lines or cell lines lacking mitochondrial DNA. <coughs> so I'm just going to give you a couple examples of you know, analyzing uh, these cell lines. Uh, this is just two of our ATP constructs, purify DNA, do PCR with primers that are specific to uh, tags that we put on them, so uh, they'll be specific to our uh, exogenously expressed genes, and uh, did these in triplicate, and you can uh, see uh, those. And so the same for the uh, RNA, so purify the RNA fraction and do uh, PCR uh, full length or uh, parts of the, uh, of the gene. And then look for expression uh, in, uh, in these 293 cells uh, with uh, antibodies uh, against uh, our flag tech construct. And so here is a, a typical cytoplasmic staining pattern for uh, a known mitochondrial gene, TIM23. And so we can see uh, cytoplasmic expression of our ATP6 constructs here. And so what are uh, super intern Sarah Fazal had spent the summer doing is doing this over and over and over and over and over again. And you should all go uh, look at her poster uh, uh, to get the uh, to get the details from her and ask her lots of hard questions to send her off back to grad school uh, next week. Um, so here's a panel of uh, of some more uh, immunofluorescence uh, ND1 and ND4. Uh, the same ATP6 and ATP8. We haven't uh, started the cytochrome B yet, but we, like I said, we have the cell lines and we're ready to start analyzing them. So uh, I have some uh, preliminary data to show you on activity of these complexes. And so to introduce that, each of these complexes has a unique activity that can be assayed for. So complex one has the uh, you know, transfer of uh, NADH, NADH into NAD, and then transfer of phosphate groups between uh, ADP and APP in complex five. And so we've uh, uh, started just barely analyzing those two complexes, so I have some very preliminary data uh, for you here. Uh, first of all, on the right, uh, we did uh, blue native gels, uh, which is a typical experiment to do.